with Daytona 500 champion William Byron and his trusty crew chief, Rudy Fugel. You two are no strangers to the winner's circle. The name of this show is The Winner's Circle. And I think it's really appropriate because very few have done this in their interviews after you won the Daytona 500, was to have you both here together because you're such a team. Now, the part I want to start with is the end, where you did not know for sure if you had won, and Rudy Fugel is crying on the radio. And I love the passion. Take it from your perspective, then we'll get to Rudy. Yeah, I mean, for for me, I've never been in that position where coming to the white, you know, and and having the the caution come out, not knowing, you know, really where we were in position wise. But I felt like I had a, a general idea that we were ahead. Yeah, you're just kind of going through that that guessing time frame of just you know waiting for the word from NASCAR, and then when we did get the word, he immediately got emotional. So it was like. You know, I felt like that was for a good reason. Like I, I knew, I felt like his emotion was not because we had lost, but, uh, but yeah, it was still. I guess for me, I, I, I'm like, I need the certainty. I need to hear the words. So it was, it was great. Once I, once I heard that, and I felt like I was just on cloud nine. So what does the Daytona 500 win mean to a crew chief? People forget to ask crew chiefs this. It's like on your resume now, and it's huge for you as well. But you know, you helped deliver a Daytona 500 win. Rudy Fugel. Yeah, for me, you know, the Daytona 500 is just something that, you know, is, a, is from a little kid, that's that's the one race that you always watch. You know, it, it, no matter what was going on, everybody that I knew was watching the Daytona 500. So you knew how big it was. And I can remember the days that all we talked about was Richard Petty had seven championships and seven Daytona 500 wins. You know, and the Dale Hernard didn't have any. And, and those things, right? I remember all those days, so I knew how big it was. And it's just, I think it's just ingrained in you. And then you go down there, um, I've been down there 20 years working on a car of some sort or a truck or whatever. And uh, you know, just, I, I've won a race before, but never as a crew chief. And it just it just hit me with the 500 being the way it was. It was, it was just, it's just amazing. And how bad have you wanted it? And I told you like a year ago, you were fierce. I saw it in you. Yeah, I mean, there's always been an edge inside for me. It doesn't, it doesn't always come out publicly or even to people I'm, close to sometimes I leave it in there and, and you know I'm trying to do better about that but yeah it's uh, I think it's it's honestly just um, there's a lot of passion and a lot of a lot of things that go into it and I think you always think about all the people it took to get you to this point you don't want to all that work to go unnoticed or, or not be worth it and you know we met at Buffalo Wild Wings and we <laughs> sat down and I could tell right away that he had a confidence in me and uh, we had a, a general understanding of each other and what it took to be fast in racing and uh you know we've just we've always been kind of the or at least i have and him with me have always kind of been the underdogs the ones that don't really uh, make a lot of noise but i feel like um when we strap in on sundays we're we're all about going fast and trying to win i don't think you should let that edge out let it be <laughs> the stealth i mean why should you show everyone right yeah i think you know we just try to go about our our business that's really just um, kind of working towards each goal. I, I think for me, the, the fire's burning to not disappear the rest of the season, you know, and try to try to be a consistent threat. And I think, um, you know, th this win fuels that for sure. And, but to your point about the Daytona 500, I think it's always been such an elusive race for us. We've gone down there with a lot of expectation and hope and great fast race cars and all the tools to, to go win it. and it's typically been a disappointing finish. So I think for us this year, it felt different. It felt like we had, um, no matter what the circumstances were, and he probably doesn't know this, but he never wavered on his confidence in me throughout the week, going to backup car, all these things that happened, I just felt like he was rolling with the punches and we were just kind of moving through it. And uh, we put ourselves in a position at the end of the weekend to get the win. Right, because Rudy, normally Hendrick wins the pole at Daytona, you did not. You knew the internal story of Hendrick Motorsports, that you guys were gonna work harder to be faster in the race and have that together. But after you didn't get the pole, and he's talking about then what happens, and you talked about having to go to a backup car, what was the message? What was the motivation? What did you tell your driver? I don't think he lacks any confidence, but you guys are a team together in that mojo that keeps you driven. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, what's what's up next? You know, that's kind of, he said that, you know, 
whatever the situation was, not getting the pole, not being on the front row, which gives you that lock, lets you go race in the duels and told them to go race. You know, in the last couple of years, I don't know that I've told them just to go race confidently. So told them to go race and, and I think he learned a lot, even though we got in that accident. Um, you know, we still finished that race. Uh, we learned a lot of things. Go to the backup car, here we go. You know, so um, yeah, I want to instill that confidence in him to keep going and keep pushing because, um, you know, he goes with the team a lot. You know, he's, he's a great team player, so we're all together. Our, our, we all feed off of each other. There's not, there's not one person that always leads us. I can't stop looking at your ring. Mm -hmm. Let's see it. It's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a close-up on this? That is gigantic. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool. It's been, it's been passed around a lot, so it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's neat. I think, um, it, you know, right now it sits on my nightstand. As it, you say I have confidence, but I, I have to have a reminder every yeah. now and then. So it, uh, it sits on the nightstand. I'm, I'm sure it will probably throughout the season, but it's pretty cool. You talked about the imposter syndrome because you started in iRacing, and Rudy talked about the weekend and, you know, believing in yourself and whatnot. But everybody's talked about your preparation. Denny Hamlin said that you are one of the most prepared drivers. He gave you massive compliments on his podcast. What kind of preparation did it take to win the Daytona 500? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I am very prepared during the week, but I feel like I switch on a different mindset when I get in the car. And um, the quicker I can get in that mindset, the more things kind of flow. But, but yeah, I mean, to me, if I'm not prepared, typically that's when the anxiety and the stress and kind of not getting in that flow in, inside the car happens. So for me, it's just, it's kind of a cadence that I have to have to be successful. And fortunately for me, I feel like in the start of my career, I didn't have a ton of success. So I had to really learn like, what is it that it's going to take for me to be successful? And, um, and then when it clicked, I feel like it's, you know, sustainable, hopefully. So I don't know, everyone has their own process, but I feel like I enjoy the process I have with my team. and. Um, I just enjoy, yeah, racing, I guess. Rudy, uh, what did your driver do in the Daytona 500 that was so right that it helped you accomplish your goal? Let's, let's talk you looking at your driver. William, lean awkward. back with that big ring on and he'll, <laughs> yeah. he'll brag about you. Yeah, I mean, really just to be able to, number one is to be able to move through everything, um, no matter what was going on through the week and have a clear mind, trusting in the backup car, trusting your guys, go out there and do your thing. Um, but specifically during the race is every time we had to come down pit road and do our thing during during the green flag stops is that execution of that, you know, and that's getting the pit road, passing cars, getting the pit road, running the pit road speed lights, getting in the box, getting out of the box and leaving. And next thing you know, we're, we're the biggest gainer every single time. So um, I think 20 some spots every single time. So that's that's a lot to make that happen. And we don't have a shot to win without without getting that track position. So uh, really, really proud of that because that's that takes a lot of work. That's come a long ways over all these Speedway events to, to realize what makes all those things happen. And he's done that. So I'm really proud of him. What do you think people don't realize about winning the Daytona 500 and what it takes? You know, you watch on TV and the winner's circle, people are paying attention now to kind of pulling the curtain back and yeah. seeing you two in director's chairs, you with the big ring on, you know, Daytona 500 champs. What do people not realize that you want to tell them? Um, I think honestly just the intensity of that, that race and really like in the last 10 laps of the race, just how much, how many little moves it takes to put yourself in a position to win. I think that's probably, it's probably hard to see that from the outside. It probably looks like any other speedway race, but the intensity in the gaps and the inches that it takes to be successful, I mean, I feel like I'm probably the only one that witnesses that and the other drivers know that, but um, it just, yeah, it's a different, different intensity out there. Um, it's pretty amazing. Did you sleep good that night? I didn't sleep much. <laughs> um, <laughs> two hours, but, but yeah, I did sleep. I slept pretty well, but I'd say all week I was really on adrenaline. And <laughs> finally about Friday, I got tired and I was like, that adrenaline started to wear off, but it, it was amazing. I mean, all week it was, it felt like adrenaline. Well, it's so good to see you. And I congratulate you on winning the Daytona 500 and Rudy Fugel, really truthfully, what an incredible crew chief that he is. And you are, I don't want to say an unbeatable duo, but you are going to be a duo to reckon with this year and to come out of the gate winning the Daytona 500 and knowing that people have to look at that 
the big trophy, right? You put the fear in their hearts a little bit. Well, I appreciate it. I think we're, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to, get, to keep ourselves up there, but we definitely, between the two of us, we have the tools to do it, and, and I think we know that, and it's just a matter of, of crossing all those hurdles when they get there. I'm here with Jeff Cadero, the front tire changer, and Ryan Patton, the tire carrier, for the Daytona 500 champion number 2014. Ryan, William Byron said that you were the first one on the front stretch, and always are, and you have the mojo, and that usually happens. But can you take us through the feeling of the pit crew and what it felt like as William wins the Daytona 500 and you get to him first? You look back at the last restart, and you think we've got a pretty good chance to, to get the win. Um, obviously, in my career, I've been up front where that's worn, turned out well for us, and I've been up front where we've been you know, wrecked on the back straightaway. So um, we knew we had a good chance. I'm pretty superstitious, so I'm not moving. I'm just waiting for something to happen, and Jeff smacks me in the chest, and he's like, we took the white. And so <laughs> I felt like we had a good feeling about it, um, but then to hear, hear NASCAR come on the radio and say 24 to the front straight away, um, you're the winner, was an amazing feeling. Um, we've got a great group of guys here. Um, we're like a bunch of brothers. I know it sounds so cliche, but we spent a lot of time together um, on the road at the practice pad in the weight room, and we really are like brothers. And so these guys work their guts out day in and day out. Um, they show up, they do everything right um, to the level of expectation that is set by Hendrick Motorsports. And we've got a great camaraderie from the road crew to the pit crew, and, and together is just a special celebration there on the start finish line. So you run out and what, you pick up Byron and you shake him up, what do you do? And what was your feeling about the whole thing? Pretty much, um, I'd been a part of you know some big wins and some Coke 600s championship, and to win the Daytona 500 just, I don't want to say it exceeds them, but it definitely, it's, it's in a level of excitement that you just don't feel when you win a regular race because that race is so special. So to go out there and be able to celebrate like as soon as he gets out of the car with the whole road crew, the pit crew, the driver, Rudy was out there, Mr. H came out there. It was just, it's an awesome feeling because you know like how hard those races are to win. You have to be very lucky. You have to do all the preparation. Everything just kind of has to fall right. What was the conversation? After you did not get the pole, you're looking ahead to the race, you guys are ready to pit the car. I think, you know, very methodical, right? We, we had to go to a backup car because unfortunately we crashed it in the duel. So the road crew guys worked their guts out, you know, Thursday and all day Friday to get on track for that practice. And I think everyone was under the impression we had a pretty good piece. We just didn't know how good. And the whole time, you know, as the race played on, we were just very confident in executing the strategy, executing the game plan. Throughout the day, we checked all those boxes and ultimately that's why this trophy's here today. Jeff, talk about the mishap on pit road incident that could have been horrendous. Talk about that and what the pit crew felt about that and how close you guys came to disaster, really. Yeah, so we caught an early caution in the race and uh, the strategy from pretty much everybody on pit road was just to come, get enough fuel so you can get to the end of the stage. So when you have when you pit at a speedway race, there's so many cars in the lead. Almost the whole field is on the lead lap. So pit road is a very hectic and busy place, comers and goers in and out of the pit boxes. And when you're only in the pit box for a couple of seconds for a little splash of gas, you know, you're leaving and other cars are trying to pull into their box. So the 48 who was pitted two stalls behind us who had better track position than us when we came down pit road, they got their splash of gas and as they were leaving, we started to come in. And it was good on, you know, Alex not to run over us and it was good on William to be able to avoid him. But ultimately we ended up missing our pit stall, pulling in the 38's pit stall and having to back in. We got thrown a curveball. We came in for a few only, and then when we missed the pit stall, you know, we're gonna be the last car leaving pit road. Might as well put four tires on at that point. And everybody was ready to react from the pit crew to behind the wall, Rudy, William. So it was very, those moments right there can define a race, because if, if something like that gets really hectic, it's how everybody reacts to it. But nobody was, nobody was freaking out, nobody was concerned. Everyone's like, hey, look, that didn't work. Let's just put four tires on it, and we'll go out there. We'll continue to run our race. We'll adjust our strategy. And ultimately, if the cards are right, we'll be there at the end. You know, for the winner's circle, we take people behind the scenes to see things that maybe they don't see. Pull the curtain back. You both mentioned the trophy. How big is that to you guys? You're right in front of the trophy. You can't stop looking at it. The Daytona 500 championship trophy. Yeah, that's a, that's a special one for sure. Um, it's still, still kind of surreal for us yeah. because, you know, we didn't we had a short minute to celebrate Sunday night before we had to go pit an Xfinity race. So this is the most time that we've spent with this trophy, <laughs> so she looks good. <laughs> okay, the inside scoop. Uh, you didn't get to party heavily 
after the Daytona 500 you pitted the Xfinity car but there was I hear a party on Thursday night and we want the details don't we I mean we went out <laughs> Charlotte knew we were there yeah <laughs> How does the 24 team celebrate a win, and how did you celebrate this one? I think it's just, you know, we just want to get together as a group. You know, like um, we had a little get together where we had the big trophy, and, and William had, you know, taking pictures with everybody, because a lot of that goes into what we do is not just the guys that go to the racetrack. It's a lot about, you know, our spouses and our significant others that are at home, and they don't get to celebrate those moments with us at the racetrack. So for us to have a gathering and get together where we can bring those people in and we can enjoy it as a family, as a group of all of us, um, that's something super special. I've been a part of other teams before and not every team or not every driver does that, but I think William understands how important it is and I think Rudy understands how important it is to have the families involved because they are such a huge part of all of it. They allow us to go do this. You know, They pick up the slack at home when we're out on the road. So it's really something super special to do that, and uh, it's just memories you're going to have forever. Well, you know I love covering your story, so I want to say congratulations, Daytona 500 champion, awesome. pick crew number Thank 24. You. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, Jeff Gordon, please describe for me what you saw and felt and soaked in as William Byron, who was given 18 to 1 odds by the folks in Vegas to win the Daytona 500. You have done so much in your career, but where did you go? Where were you sitting? I was holding my breath. I, so I, I was, you know, most of the race I was on a pit box. I think I was on the nine pit box um, that day and the sun went down, it started getting cold and I didn't have enough <laughs> layers. So I went back to my bus and I decided to just, you know, watch the, the rest on, on TV. And so there was a bit of a delay on the TV because I didn't have the live feed, but I had the radio. And, and so, you know, I just was waiting. All right, did they cross the line with the white flag before the caution came out? And I'm listening on the radio. They're all trying to figure out who won it, who won it, who won it. At that time, I, I wasn't even, I didn't even realize how close the 48 was to, to William that he'd gotten to the outside. So once I realized that, I was like, Either way, if the costume came out and they crossed the line, we're good, right? We, we, we've got the Daytona 500. But uh, when I heard the 24 team start to just go nuts on the radio and say it was, you know, it was theirs, then I rushed out, super excited, jumping up and down, you know, head over to, to pit road. And then I see the team out there celebrating, um, you know, out at the start finish line. And, and I saw Rick in the distance, so I'm like, here I go, I'm, I'm going out there uh, to, to join that. And that, that was so fun. I, you know, I, I even surprise myself sometimes when I get this excited about seeing one of our teams win. There's nothing like being in the driver's seat um, and, and being a part of that team to go get the win. Um, but I, I, I'm more connected than I ever thought I could be, even though I'm not in the driver's seat. And so I, I'm enjoying it almost as much as they are. He had a chip on his shoulder mm -hmm. and he said he did. And I interviewed him after he did not win the championship at Phoenix. And from that time to now, did you know he had that chip? I mean, I didn't until we were in Victor Lane and we started having this conversation about it. And so I'm always trying to find with all of our teams, all of our drivers, you know, what, what motivates them, what incentivizes them to just push a little more, work a little harder, you know, just, just how, how to go out and get that win or more wins or big wins in that moment. So now that I know this about William, I'm gonna use it for sure, but I'm glad he used it to go win the Daytona 500 because I, I sort of understand when, when you know, you've accomplished as much as they've accomplished and the media or the fans or social media wants to put more focus on others, um, and you think, man, I think I deserve this, or we as a team deserve this. We've shown what more do we have to do. Um, that can work to your advantage, and I'm glad it's working to their advantage right now. Well, I want to ask you about you, because you won the Daytona 500 three times, and I re-watched the video of your wins, 97, 99, 2005. Earnhardt stalked you in 99, gave you a love bump at the win. 97, you were hung out to drive but came back. That old huge phone in Victory Lane handed to you <laughs> yes. in the car. Then fighting off a fierce Kurt Busch in 2005. What makes this win by William Byron different than those you experienced as a driver? How much has it changed? And 
And of course, ah, oh, that phone. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'll never forget that either. That is that is fun. Listen, back then, I was just happy to be able to talk to somebody on the phone in Victor. It was Rick Hendrick, right? And it was Rick, of yeah. course, because he wasn't there with us. But, um, you know, I just think the game's changed. I mean, what it takes to have a car in position to win the Daytona 500 is different today. The, the cars are so equal. Um, you see the bump draft in the, it, you know, they're, they're three wide. Everybody's just pushing and shoving. That, that just doesn't seem to be a real advantage um, other than maybe being able to lock bumpers and push a little bit. Otherwise, all the cars just seem like there's a blanket thrown over them. Where I feel like when, you know, especially the first couple years uh, the, that I won the Daytona 500, my very first time I was in the Daytona 500 in, in my rookie season, there was only five of us that were really in position at the end of that race. It was a long green flag run, handling was important, and, and it was just amongst us. Now, it, every decision, every split second, every you know, bit of the strategy, you know, how you execute as a total team is what's putting you in position to win the Daytona 500. And I just think it seems to me, you know, it's just a lot harder to get it done. There's a lot of factors that play into it. So good, I have a photo for Oh God, you. yeah, there's the, there's the phone. The it's <laughs> as big as my that. face. <laughs> You're saying to Rick, I got this big phone in my head. I'm not gonna do with it. Yeah, oh, oh how things God. have changed. Listen, I've got this Daytona 5. This is not even from 97. This Hold is from, it up so this we can is, see Yeah, it. this look is at, from look at 2005. Daytona 500. Um, and I, was, I brought this today um, because we were having the lunch with, with the whole team and, and oh, William. Oh, that's your 2005 this is, win. This is mine from 05, and I, I brought this because I wanted to show William how things have changed in the hardware, too. What did he say? <laughs> I what mean, luckily, the trophy hasn't changed. The, the trophy is exactly the same, which is amazing. Um, but, but, but the ring uh, and the bling is, is gone to a whole nother level uh, if you look at his ring versus, versus this one. But I, the, the, the symbolism and the pride is still the same. So everyone talks about William Byron and how hard he works. And, and you mentioned it after the race was over, after he won. And others have mentioned it. The competitors, Benny Hamlin mentioned it on his podcast. So how much do you know of how hard he works? Can you paint a picture of what it takes? I, I think it's about you know how much time and effort are you going to spend with your engineers, your crew chief, your, your team in the simulator, looking at data, watching film, um, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and, and there's, you know, th there's, there's different ways that you can uh, use that time. Um, and I just think William's one of those guys that, that he uses his time very efficiently and very effective um, because, you know, maybe it's the chip, right? Maybe it's the chip on his shoulder that he's like, if people are not going to give me credit for, for, you know, what I'm doing out there on the racetrack, then I'm just gonna keep working harder and keep winning more races until they finally do give me the credit. And, and that's, that's what I see, you know, in also keeping himself fit. I mean, just looking at every aspect, just like these uh, mechanics and engineers do to build that race car to be as perfect as it can be, I think he's doing the same thing as a race car driver. How badass is William Byron when it comes to talent and what he might be able to do? And I told him a year ago, the word I use every time I saw him in victory lane was fierce. You are fierce. Yeah. He doesn't seem like that if you don't know him. You're not <laughs> behind the scenes, but he's fierce. Well, there, there's. it's interesting to see somebody's alter ego come out and their personality change when they go into a competitive environment. And, and I think I've seen a lot of guys that, that, that were like that. Um, you put the helmet on, you strap in, you fire up the engine, and it's and it's time to go. Um, you know, there, there's there's a fire that's burning inside you, and and sometimes you maybe even surprise yourself of the abilities and the talent and what you're capable of doing. And I, I think that's what what has happened to William. Uh, but now, because he's been able to accomplish it, now it's coming with confidence, and it's coming with, you know, I can do this. And, and, you know, still there's some doubters, so I want to go prove them wrong. Um, but, but, yeah, I think he's, he, he, he's fired up in the car. I mean, you, you know, when, when you see it in the moment where he's got, and I saw it in Xfinity, I saw it in Truck, now I see it in Cup, that he's, he finds a way to make the pass, to get himself, you know, the win. Um, and, and that's a thinking driver. That's, that's a driver that wants it, it's passionate about it. But you also see it when things don't go well, <laughs> you know, and, and you hear that, that, that um, 
anger and, and that, that's inside him when it doesn't go the way that he feels like it was, you know, it was capable of going. And that, that, that's what drives and motivates.